Welcome to the Bundakama, the place where you will find all the needed objects in order to discover yourself. But be careful, this cabinet of curiosities will uncover things you never wanted to see unveiled. This room will open the abyss of darkness for you. You will see how this darkness will lead you to the light you were searching for all this time. Wundakama is excited to be your guide to that light. So this video is not an assessment of what's right and what's wrong. This is simply a behavioral assessment of Andrew Tate and I have taken this I have made this assessment from many many media articles and information from his own interviews and I'm going to talk about all of this. You're going to see how it's divided. Uh it's really detailed so <laughs> I am simply a psychology student who does not judge or assess if this behavior is right or wrong. So I'm going to offer you various perspectives on what might be happening both from Andrew Tate's behavior and from the prosecutors and victims who were against him. So with that said, this video will be extremely triggering especially for for survivors of any kind of abuse. So please, if you feel triggered, contact a professional or contact a friend or someone close to you because I am, I truly care about how you're feeling. And then if you want to watch it, please, when you feel ready, watch this video. So I'm going to start uh, with the analysis with using background information from media in order for me to compare it with his own personal claims and interviews. And so if you already know everything about Andrew Tate, please feel free to skip this part. I'm just going to mention most of what he has done. So we take that into consideration in this assessment. And you can skip to the next part, which is the analysis based on his own personal claims and personal interviews and behavior. So according to a Wyan article, Andrew Tate became a sensation because of various accusations of sexual assault, suspected for holding an American woman against her will and raping a Moldovan woman twice. He has received charges of human trafficking, rape and creating an organized crime syndicate. In the case of the Moldovan woman, it is said that she initially thought that it was love after meeting him through Instagram. Later on, after they met in London, they discussed marriage and the first thing he asked from her is absolute loyalty by saying you must understand that once you're mine, you'll be mine forever. Okay, so we can already see where this is going. If And this is especially worrying if they were dating for a really short time, because that sounds kind of obsessive. And nobody without any specific intentions wouldn't say something like that without leaving the other partner without a choice. Someone would argue that they don't consider this a strong enough evidence because there may be a chance that this is foreplay and the argument is valid. However, if we take all of the information into consideration, the chances are high that this came from a pathological intention because you will see later. These mentioned allegations are a part of an unpublished document which is dated on 30th of December 2022. In the same document, it's reported that the Tate brothers used deception and intimidation to put women under their control in order to transform them into slaves. So apparently, Eugene was their lawyer who apparently defended the Tate brothers by saying that the women lived off the backs of the Tate brothers. He acknowledged that the sex with the Moldovan woman was, a, was consensual. I don't know all the information from the document, and I'm not a lawyer, but I would argue that just because the Tate brothers chose to financially take care of the women, does, that doesn't mean that he owns them. And about the question if it was, if the sex was consensual or not, I would actually ask the victim, but, and I will return back about this case. And there are two women named Beatrice and Lazmina who contradicted the statement about the victimized six women on Romanian TV station called Antena 3. Beatrice claimed, you cannot list me as a victim if I say I am not one. 
and I saw something pretty familiar about his brother, Tristan Tate, that he dated a news broadcaster named uh, Bianca Dracusano, which makes me question if there is something behind the scenes. There may be a link or there may not. This is just a hypothesis. And last but not least, the Tate brothers were suspected about keeping an American woman as a captive in their mansion in Romania. According to this article, authorities suspected that Tristan Tate lured the woman to Romania by expressing false feelings for her. So, according to an unpublished document, he brought her in Romania with a promise that she will earn 100k per month. And by paying for her travel ticket, he brought her to his house that was supposedly guarded with two guards, which they would not let her own free without his permission. This already looks to me as if these brothers have a lot of issues with control, as I said. Since it is said that there were cameras everywhere, they didn't let women walk around without their permission, which sounds to me as a desperate way to avoid abandonment to the degree where it becomes this intense. I think that I'm going to read these thoughts because I want to express them the most in the most accurate way and as if as they were written so the american woman was messaged that they were watching her all of the time and so she was under their control it is mentioned that she was terrified of the two brothers and she was only permission to go out with other women i'm going to mention that the same lawyer again eugene or Eugen, I don't know. He supposedly defended the offenders that she had a phone and access to the internet and so she could leave the house whenever she wanted. I'm not sure if this defense is elaborated enough, but let me make something clear. When you're abused, no matter where you are or how many ways you have of escape, you're influenced by the environment. Especially in an unsafe environment where you have absolutely no one to rely on except for the abusers, no matter how much internet you have, who will you rely on? With guards in your house in a country you are not familiar with and other women who can do anything about the situation, who will you talk to? Are you going to call the police? What then? I mean, you have two guards in your house. <laughs> what about the consequences? It's a grave mistake. To underestimate the situation victims are in because if they had a safe way to escape from that unsafe environment, trust me, they would have escaped in every situation, wouldn't they? And of course that when you have terrifying consequences, victims cannot escape that easily. I can see that a lot of professionals are making this mistake. In social psychology this is called the fundamental attribution error where they tend to underestimate the power of the situation and they overestimate the control of the person in it by seeing their behavior as nothing more than a trait. This is when we fail to recognize that the change of the person's behavior is due to the influence of the situation. With this fundamental attribution error, we assign the victim more as a personality trait than actually seeing the influence of the situation. This has caused a massive prejudice all around the globe this happens globally in the society, which is part of the shaming of victims because of the so-called victim mentality. People unconsciously make this error by thinking that the victims had control over the situation and they didn't exercise control because they want to seek attention. Most of the abuse survivors seek answers, not attention. So people unconsciously make this assumption that personality is nothing more than a trait and that victims want want to be in a place of victimization because they apparently want to seek attention and that's why they don't do anything about the situation. And most of the abuse survivors seek help and answers instead of attention. And this about this, there is a professional who agrees with me. Family all the way to the self-help toxic positivity crowd ideas is that I think there is an intense aversion to a survivor processing what happened to them. And I find that the aversion is instantaneous, uh, like the toxic commenter online or the bad therapist or the cousin or even the toxic positive psych Instagram influencer. Um, the messages don't feel that way. Don't come at me with that. I feel like you're wanting sympathy from me and that you'll trap me in that kind of victimhood and I'll have to take care of you and you're gonna make me a hostage. It's, a, it's as if that it's a, you're behaving in a way that might be contagious. 
and especially from the commenters online, you'll see this marked reaction like it's the survivor is breaking a social taboo, a contract to just be as repressed and as tough as they are to take it on the chin like the rest of us and don't drag others down with them. So survivors who want answers and help with feelings like what happened with Jay's, say Jay's father, who hit them for upsetting their ridiculous mother, where Jay isn't looking for a handout or a pity party. Most clients even struggle taking in mirroring and empathy and reflection. They're not seeking this attention. Um, in fact, they even don't like the attention actually. We're usually just in need of having a safe witness. And people throwing the don't be a victim stuff around, don't get that processing and talking and doing therapy work is the action of getting on and moving on with our lives. Because this was not viral enough, obviously. Andrew Tate's reputation started to get some more heavy blows by his wiretape going viral, where he confesses that he made women to do a lot of illegal things, such as moving money, illegal things, documents, etc. So supposedly he was also being accused because of putting pressure on two women of getting tattoos with the message Tate's property. He also did shady businesses with a former police officer who was also arrested for human trafficking. I mean, the police was supposed to protect us, right? We all know what they're doing behind the scenes. And my suspect is even stronger after I have seen that there's evidence of him threatening a woman into staying in the house and not leaving it. We're going to start with the behavior analysis. Okay, so the reason why I had my second thoughts at first was because social media can be really fabricated and many people can easily be turned to into antagonists and into enemies. And the amount of control people can have with social media is insane. And let's not talk about how twisted the stories can be and how twi twisting a situation can be made. From what I have seen, there were many scandals of misinformation throughout media where accusations actually turned false at the end. And that's why I had this mindset of taking as much information from Tristan and Andrew Tate's behavior before actually making a conclusion. But these accusations of Andrew and Tristan made so much sense <laughs> to the point where you can't just gaslight so many people by being in denial. I would have had much more second thoughts if Andrew's behavior wasn't <laughs> obvious in the wiretape confessions. So from what we know, he quoted things like, women should be responsible for being raped. He announced himself as sexist. He said, I'm not a rapist, but I like the thought of doing anything I want. I enjoy being liberated. While well, he was explaining that in Romania, he's less likely to face rape charges, that he liked the corruption there and many more claims, which already just sold him out. So what first concerns me is that he downplays on mental health issues, which adds to the scale towards more, path what should I call it, pathological behavior. He also compares women to dogs. So before I dive into the why of Andrew Tate's behavior, I want to mention some of Freud's outlooks around pathology and psychopathy in order for you to understand the full context of what I want to talk about, what I am talking about and what my analysis is, basically. So as you already know, Freud suggests that all of the unacceptable urges and desires are kept in our unconscious through the process called repression. That's known as the Freudian slip. According to Freud, unconscious drives influenced by sex and aggression, along with childhood sexuality, are the forces that influence our personality. So if you don't know, he was the first to study the workings of the unconscious mind. He compared the mind to an iceberg, while claiming that only one of ten parts is conscious, while the rest is unconscious. He suggested that slips of the tongue are actually sexual or aggressive urges accidentally slipping out of our unconscious. He thought that speech errors such as this are quite common. He thinks that our personality develops from a conflict between two forces, our biological aggressive and pleasure-seeking drives versus our internal control over these drives. 
and our personality is the result of our efforts to balance these two competing forces. About these internal conflicts, he mentioned three interacting systems within our minds. He called the id, ego, and superego. So the unconscious id contains our most primitive drives or urges and is present from birth. It directs impulses for hunger, thirst, and sex. But through our social interactions with parents and others in our childhood, the ego and superego develop in order to help control the id. The superego develops as the child interacts with others, learning the social rules for right and wrong. The superego acts as our conscience. It's our moral compass and tells us how we should behave. It strives for perfection and judges our behavior, leading to feelings of pride or feelings of guilt. The ego is the rational part of our personality. It's what Freud considered to be the self and is the part of our personality that is seen by others. Its job is to balance the demands of the id and the superego in the context of reality. Thus, it operates on what Freud called the reality principle. The ego helps the id satisfy its desires in a realistic way. The id and superego are in constant conflict because the id wants instant gratification regardless of the consequences, but the superego tells us that we must behave in socially acceptable ways. Thus, the ego's job is to find the middle ground. It helps satisfy the ease desires in a rational way that will not lead us to feelings of guilt. So this is the most important part here, right here. According to Freud, a person who has a strong ego has a healthy personality. And so let's head towards pathology. Freud thought that imbalances in the system can lead to neurosis, anxiety disorders, or unhealthy behaviors. A person with dominant superego might be controlled by feelings of guilt and deny themselves even by of socially acceptable pleasures. And conversely, if the superego is weak or absent, a person might become a psychopath. This is why I wanted to let you know about Freud's theories, because I wanted to emphasize the role of the superego. Overly dominant ego might be seen in an over-controlled individual whose rational grasp on reality is so strong that they are unaware of their emotional needs or in a neurotic who is overly defensive. So even though Freud's theories are immensely rejected, they are basically the baseline of every, almost every treatment and therapy. So I'm going to mention Carl Jung just for a second here, so bear with me. Carl Jung extended his work, except he added very important differences. His split from Freud was based on two major disagreements. Jung did not accept that sexual drive was the primary motivator in a person's mental life. He also thought that Freud's concept of a personal unconscious was incomplete. He invented the concept of analytical psychology, as defined here, on working to balance opposing forces of conscious and unconscious thought and experience within one's personality. According to Jung, this work is a continuous learning process mainly occurring in the second half of life, of becoming aware of the unconscious elements and integrating them into the conscious. I am mentioning Jung because of the concept of the collective unconscious, which is a very important one in my analysis. So the collective unconscious, in definition here, is a universal version of the personal unconscious holding mental patterns or memory traces which are common to all of us. These ancestral memories, which Jung called archetypes, are represented by universal themes in various cultures as expressed uh, through literature, art, and dreams. So now you're ready. Let's get back to Andrew Tate. So the first thing that really concerned me is that religion has a big influence on Andrew. In order to confirm my theories, I watched a couple of his interviews and I have noticed that he talks about religion a lot in a way that it becomes a whole theme of his speeches. It's kind of crazy. Like my, my whole religious experience, my whole religious journey is I prefer to spend time in the most religious places on earth. I think they're the best places to be. And 
the religion is not the problem itself. I'm going to elaborate on this. Romania is very, it's the opposite of Dubai. It's extremely Orthodox Christian. It's actually the most Christian country in the world. So mm. what does Christian mean? Mm. Like who's not a Christian? You go to Christian nations and everyone says they're a Christian. Look how they live their lives. Go yeah. into the average church. Is anyone actually fearful of God? Anybody? Mm -hmm. No, the girls are out on Saturday night drinking and then mm. they turn up to church because their parents made them. Mm -hmm. Like there's, there's no substance to the religion. And I spend most of my time between Dubai, which is, you know, very overtly uh, Muslim. And then I come to back to Romania, which is very overtly Christian, but both of them have strong faith. And I think a lot of the problems with the world today is that the West is lacking faith. And I don't like being around. I don't like being an agnostic or atheistic societies anymore. I try to avoid them if possible. Also, Islam very closely reflects my personal beliefs. I So the concerning fact about religion is that many people use it as a validation for their unhealthy and abusive behavior. And I've read, I have explained this really well here, so I just want to read it. Uh, and do you remember what I mentioned about the superego? That if it's weak or absent, it leads to pathological behavior? As I explained here, religion is one of the loopholes through which the superego weakens, because when your adult beliefs that are not yours, it's the easiest to put all of the responsibility and control on them in order to completely diminish shame and guilt. And I need you to process this. Just, just for a second. And so look at the whole history. I mean, every single war was motivated by religion. And with religion, people would disassociate from their shame and guilt in the easiest way because imagine how would you cope with murdering innocent lives look at the crusade wars the ottomans look at the middle ages i mean women were burned and raped just because of a feeling of inferiority and being afraid of powerlessness and you can search on the internet as much as you want you can find so many criminals and murderers who come from religious backgrounds and I'm going to continue reading. The religion itself is not the issue. We misunderstand in what we believe in. Humanity believes in religions that it doesn't understand yet. Religion is also one of the main factors that influence sexual suppression. I would even consider sexual suppression as the biggest problem. You all have heard of the common cases where people of different sexual orientations are repressed because of their religious families. Sex is a taboo in religion, especially religious families, and that need is pushed back into the subconscious. And we all know the consequences of that. You can't push an urge forever. You can open almost every crime novel and read so many inspired characters who were sexually suppressed. Sexual suppression leads to unsatisfied needs, and the more we are not expressing one of the most basic drives, the more our ego and superego become imbalanced and impaired. Let's not start talking about what happens with the Eid. And this is exactly in the case of Andrew Tate. I do not see his sexual exploitation of women as coincidental. His whole life is evolving around meeting his sexual needs. And let's not talk about religious attitude towards women. I mean, look at Afghanistan. This hypothesis has led me to another one. I have noticed his attitude towards women and I can tell you for sure that he had a tyrannical mother figure or a feminine figure in his life from whom he experienced immensely unhealthy powerlessness. I would even say that he was emotionally abused by that figure, that's for sure. And do you really think that his attitude towards women was accidental? And when he says that he hates women, he actually says that he hates the feminine figure who repressed his emotions and destroyed him when he was a child. I, I assume that this happened in his childhood because every scar and trauma comes from there. So we we're powerless back then. And as children, it's very important for our parents to validate our reality as us being powerless and to take care of that reality and take us a as a part of themselves. Because if they don't acknowledge the reality of us being powerless, then the powerlessness gets even unhealthier and unhealthier. And I'm sure that that feminine figure who abused him emotionally 
stripped away his confidence and repressed his masculinity. I mean, where does that anger come from towards women then? He feels so much anger towards that abusive feminine figure from his childhood that he subconsciously expresses it through exploitation of women. Especially sexually, because I can already guess that he was castrated as a child, especially surrounded by so much religion. I assume. And let's talk about family roles. There are many, many, many common families where the narcissistic abuser is supported by the whole family system. And so how does that happen? So I'll, I'll just read this. So usually the narcissistic mother has her own soldier, which is the codependent father who acts as her soldier and defends her insanely abusive behavior. We also commonly have the scapegoat of the family, which is either the child or one of the children. The scapegoat's purpose is to keep the family together by being everybody's enemy. Usually for every problem in the family or, of course, incompatibility because they're just inescapable in abusive families. Fingers are pointed towards the scapegoat because if the scapegoat doesn't exist, then everything would have just falling apart. I need to remind you again that these patterns in the family are much, much, much more present and common than we think. Just because someone doesn't have physical abuse in his family doesn't mean that not, that emotional abuse or narcissism doesn't exist. Trust me, in families like this, even if there is no physical abuse present, the psychological effects are much, much deeper. And exactly here is where I want to connect the tyrannical feminine figure with situations like these. There is nothing more tyrannical than placing oneself as a victim in order to subconsciously get her needs met and have control, because she herself feels out of control. And I want you to know, if not Andrew, many, many, many men with repressed sexuality come from families like this. And if you want to know more about this, this is well explained by a therapist in the video Are You Just Being a Victim? Dismantling Victim Mindset by Patrick. Andrew Tate held in Romania on suspicion of human trafficking, so uh, they've done this raid in this house and they're claiming that the four suspects appear to have created an organized crime group with the purpose of recruiting, housing and exploiting women by forcing them to create pornographic content meant to be seen on specialized websites for a cost. So it doesn't sound good, but now Tate has always claimed that these webcam studios, he's always admitted to having webcam studios, but he yeah. said they were totally consensual and legal. So the big question is, you know, is this, is, has he done this or is it just the, what he would call a matrix attack? Now, what does it, what, a matrix attack? Yeah, he believes that he's always, he talks in terms of the metaphor of the matrix. He's like escape the matrix, taking the red pill, but well, everyone else like is a slow motion bullet thing. Yeah, well, it, it, it does mean that in a metaphorical way, but. What makes his attitude seem so pathological is that he has this assigned role of reality that it's against him, the so called matrix. This can become especially dangerous because when you blame the reality, you avoid taking responsibility over your actions, and so you blame every consequence as a punishment from a figure that doesn't exist. But it's a smart strategy to keep you safe, am I right? Because you stay as the victim, and that's the only way you can validate your own behavior. I can also label this behavioral pattern as the just world hypothesis, which is the belief that people get the outcomes they deserve. So anything that happens to them, positive or negative, they just understand it as, oh, I deserve this. And instead of truly taking responsibility over the consequences and his own actions and thus truly learning from them, he sees them as the matrix attacking him. This is a great way in which he diminishes his own superego and therefore he feels no concept of shame or guilt whatsoever because, of course, God has judged that upon him. There, he just needs to learn. He doesn't need to feel anything about it or do something about it. God hates him. But what is really interesting is that he talks about this matrix. Uh, a, he built a concept of, a, I guess, a different reality that is against him. But from the other side, he's he 
sells this idea that he's constantly so religious that he loves churches and all of that. Isn't that just contradicting itself? I mean, he's either religious or he's either not religious because he thinks that God is against him. Or maybe that's what religion made him think, that God is always against him and he just... When you say that you're religious, you basically claim that you believe in something outside of yourself. But he doesn't do that because he contradicts himself by saying that he believes in a matrix that attacks him. But also he's religious. So this is what I'm talking about. Literally, these patterns of thoughts cause the superego to weaken. Because when you just think of something as punishment, you, you escape the responsibility of what have I done. And this is a great way in which he diminishes his own superego and therefore he feels no shame and guilt. He is stuck in denial which harms everybody. And he doesn't want to get out of this pattern because he's safe in it. He successfully runs away from his own conscious and he escapes from the parts of him which have their needs unmet. And so I've also noticed that he has a lot of influences from his, I guess, absent father. And this is the video. I, the reason I anger somebody, everybody so much is because I'm not from a privileged background. My father was a world level chess player, mm. but he was also a straight G, which means when he got paid, he's in the casino with the women. He didn't give a fuck about, like, he, he was very clear, like, you sons got to make your own way in the world. Like, you've got food for today, so I'm out of here. Like, yeah. he, that's how he was. So we had, and when he died, he didn't leave us a penny. So there was no kind of trust fund, no kind. We didn't yeah. even have a wealthy upbringing. We came from a very poor upbringing. Mm. When we moved to England, we were in a homeless shelter. How did you learn all this? That's a good question. <laughs> I've had a interesting life. And yeah, well, I, we flew out here for you, so we've got all day to listen yeah, to yeah. it. Yeah, I've I've had an interesting life, and and I think the only way you learn lessons in life are the hard way or the harder way. I think that humans are terrible at learning lessons easily. You will see somebody make the same mistake a hundred times until that one time it really hurts. That's just how we are. And God's been quite nice to me by teaching me the hard lessons quickly. He didn't give me any chances to learn slowly. He came at me hard and fast and instantly. So I learned things very quick. <laughs> so I learned the reality of a lot of scenarios and how the world works very, very quickly because I never had any of those in between. No, Andrew, you didn't learn the lessons. You just learned how to escape from the emotions and to escape the lessons themselves. You just learned how to escape your own emotions and your own conscience. And you're so terrified of getting hurt that you exert control over everything and everybody around you because there is no other way for you to feel safe and that is something that many of us can understand because this world is unsafe and you're running the same circles except the consequences are getting worse and worse and worse and bigger and bigger but you can't see that because you don't see reality you're too terrified of it you're too terrified of reality he has this attitude of so-called real masculinity which i am sure that you know where this is going because there are so many people who sell this idea of real masculinity but in practice they have no idea what they're talking about i call this masculinity unhealthy or toxic because andrew just like many of those uh masculine people have the attitude of be a tough man and do everything despite your emotions this mindset was obviously passed down by his father and the whole society because he either didn't want to take care of him or didn't know how to take care of him. And what is concerning isn't that only Andrew has this behavior. There's so many men, so many insecure men uh, that are so afraid to love and be loved that they strive for power and for control in order to distance themselves from connections even more. At the end of the day, Andrew, you're terrified to love. And from the aspects of psychology, men tend to express their love and need for nurturing through sex. Uh, because the masculine energy acts as a container, while the feminine energy acts as the that support for the man in order to thrive, in order to achieve, and in order to expand. Because that's how those energies work. The man and the woman have 
masculine and feminine energy. So, Andrew, you just are searching for love just like everybody else. And it's a question of time until you understand that, I guess. But you, Andrew, are too terrified, too terrified from a vulnerable and consummate love. And in order to meet your needs, you try to sexually control other people because you will be abandoned again. You think that they will abandon you and that's why you need control. And money are just the, the least concerning thing for you. You just have so many unmet needs that it, it really hurts, I know. How far will you go with that unconscious control? How, how far will you go with harming women in order to meet your needs? Why would you hurt yourself along with everybody else? This is not working out for you. I mean, you're in jail. And does it really work? I mean, Andrew, what are you so afraid of? So let's get back to the case of the Moldovan woman. And I have a couple of very important things to mention about this case. And again, I think it's the best for me to read them in order to save time. So the first thing to mention is that we as collective consciousness have barely scratched the surface about knowing what is true love and healthy sex. We still don't know the fact that sex is much more complex and significant in our day-to-day -day lives and we are unaware of its connection to our fragmented consciousness. So because our consciousness is fragmented, we have multiple parts or sub-personalities. I discuss this more deeply in my other video called Why are we so afraid of happiness on this channel. We like to think that the moment we say yes to sex, that all parts of us are aligned with that decision. but. <laughs> that's not always the case. Even if you have a part of you which says no because of a certain reason or past trauma, then in reality the sex is not consensual. This commonly happens even though the two people or more, whatever, are not even aware of that. So basically you may say yes even though you have intimacy trauma, for an example, but you s automatically suppress it because women commonly suppress their own parts who are against sex because they're afraid that if they don't say yes, then their partner will abandon them. This is much more complex than just this example, but I'm going to use it for the sake of this example. So if you say yes, even though you have intimacy trauma, you may not be even aware of it because you automatically suppress it. You may not even know that the sex was not consensual, so things are really complicated. Healing sex should not heal one part of ourselves while hurting another part of ourselves either. For example, for one person, all parts of themselves might be perfectly in alignment in a given scenario with unprotected sex, meaning no condoms or preventative measures. For another person, one part of them may want the intimacy of no condom, whereas another part of them may be completely damaged by taking the risk of an unplanned pregnancy or an STD. And when that's the case, it's actually still non-consensual sex. The part that's not consenting is a part within us, though. If you truly want to learn about healthy sex and sexuality, I truly recommend watching her videos regarding those topics because they are really educational and helpful and everything she says in them should be said to the younger generations as well. They helped me personally while I, I was going through a lot of sexual trauma, so that's why I recommend them. You've talked about dark gentlemen. Mm -hmm. what, what, is, what does that mean? What's a dark gentleman? So a dark gentleman is a term that I've sort of coin to describe the, the perfect man, as it were, or the man that is mo the most attractive. And the dark gentleman is a combination of a man that is able to provide the three P. So he's able to protect, uh, provide as an you know, economic provision and parentally invest. But at the same time, he does have those dark triad characteristics, which makes him very attractive. So he threads the line between the perfect gentleman and that uh, dark triad personality. So he's able to combine those two aspects which are held in logical contrast. So I, I, I refer to it as the unity of contradictions. It's actually very similar to uh, when your dad speaks about um, chaos and order. I think he w the point that Jordan is trying to get across here is that you need a combination of the two. You need some sort of golden mean, as it were. You can't have too much order. You can't have too much chaos because in both situations, you get totalitarianism. Yeah, that makes sense.
So that would be, I feel like the dark triad too. Can you, can you list off what those characteristics are? Absolutely. So the dark triad are three personality traits that are found in individuals. So you have Machiavellianism, which is typically described as sort of manipulation or the ability to manipulate. Uh, the second is narcissism, you know, pretty straightforward. And uh, the third is psychopathy. So callousness, lying, thrill seeking. So it's said by psychologists that these three traits are quite negative. So individuals that possess these traits are dark, right? They're very um, negative individuals. Yeah. Okay. And so, but for some reason they're attractive to women. Yeah, exactly that. So these dark, but attractive. <laughs> yeah, evil, so these, but attractive. Yeah. Very, very attractive. So these, these individuals, it's important to keep in mind that they're very low in neuroticism. They're very high in openness. They're very low in conscientiousness. They're very high in extroversion. Mm. So I also want to answer the question, uh, how can people like Andrew draw and use women to make a lot of money out of them? How do women end up there at the first place? And to answer this, I will mention that a lot of women tend to go after men who have pathological characteristics. I'm going to elaborate this more on another video. I will say that because of unconscious and unresolved trauma, we project and find partners which are the same as the abusive families that we had, especially our parents. We learn the model of love by our parents and have it subconsciously engraved in our minds, along with the subconscious idea of the partner we want and our definition of love. Don't forget that we're looking for love in order to fill our own emotional starvation and desperation and we are mostly looking for thrill. So let's lead up to the last question. Uh, why, why is Andrew Tate a wake-up call and a big one and why is he so significant? And this is the part where I want to... I want you to remember at least... And I, this is what I want you to take away from it. First of all, he shows every single trauma <laughs> that is suppressed in us. He shows us every trauma that we need to pay attention to. And he's not the real problem. The more concerning problem is the number of people following him. And do you know what that tells us? It tells us that the degree of masculinity suppression is so intense that men don't know how to return their castrated masculinity back. So when I say masculinity, I think of the healthy sense of masculinity in which the man gets his needs met in a healthy way. Speaking of masculinity, I need to mention that there are so many boys who are raised by mothers who tell them that they mustn't be the best in what they do, that they are equally good like everybody else while they want to strive for being the best and therefore they're just suppressing and gaslighting their own feeling of fail being a failure or failing instead of helping them go through the process of failure in order for them to get back to their needs. They also steal their sense of assertiveness and confidence because those women are projecting their fear of unsafety. For many women, ma the masculinity itself is triggering them immensely. So many boys are raised to be passive with rejected ideas and characteristics that make them men. Because women are afraid and they have every right to be afraid. This is a terrifying world. There are certain feminists who project their fear through asserting power on boys while emotionally manipulating them because they repress their own need to be taken care of. This results with insane sexual and emotional suppression. Many men become the problem solvers of the mothers and the family psychologists. Instead of thriving with their own built confidence and assertiveness, they're stripped away from confidence. And you can see the same consequences in people just like Andrew Tate and especially his followers. There are many insecure men who are using unconscious tactics like Andrew Tate in order to get their needs met and by therefore escaping emotion so they can avoid pain. No pathology exists in order to not avoid pain. There is nothing that exists that doesn't serve as pain avoidant. That's what I want you to remember. Every core of every pathological behavior comes from repression and it's only a matter of question what kind of repression is and what kind of family role 
that the person who is considered pathological had. From women's perspective, I know that this is truly terrifying because being vulnerable in a world like this is the same as throwing yourselves in the darkness. I have been sexually harassed myself multiple times so I know how it feels. You have every right to feel scared and have the tendency to hide yourself by telling yourself that you need to become a strong, independent woman. This may work out for somebody, but that's not how our energy works. Feminine energy is supposed to be taken care of like a flower by the masculine energy. And of course, that doesn't authentically apply to every woman, but mostly. That feminine energy needs attention and care. And if if the flower thinks that it's supposed to not need rain in order to grow, then good luck. I hope that it finds water somewhere or it survives. That's the divine nature of the feminine energy. And the most interesting part is that not only women, men have that as well. Men have feminine energy. Every person has those energies, either feminine or masculine. And both need balance. But what happens in families, like what I just described, is a massive imbalance where the masculine energy becomes full of repression. So what happens in families like this is that men are so not nurtured that their masculine energy is spilling out and is imbalanced, not accordance with the feminine energy. And especially for women, no one is supposed to live alone. No one. Not even a man, not even a woman. It's really cruel to suppress your own desires and needs and deny them in order for you to be independent and live alone. Why? Why would you do that to yourself when you can find the safe people and find the right people for you? And we are interdependent species. We cannot live without one another. I mean, look at our everyday lives. Can we function without other people? Of course not. And what we also need to pay attention to is to focus on what exactly is triggering us regarding masculinity. And we need to focus on those wounds if we truly want to change the situation where the world continues to make people like Andrew and like so many others who make money out of other insecure men who have such repressed masculine energy. Especially as women, we need to start listening to our intuition. The reason why there are so many cases of women being unsafe with men is because we are gaslighting our fear. We are gaslighting our fear our feeling of unsafety and our intuition. Fear always has a valuable thing to say. It sees a threat and it knows the threat. It's valid. It exists. We, as women, often gaslight that message about the threat and the consequences are always so deadly. That's one of the biggest reasons why we constantly feel unsafe with people. It's because we suppress that intuition that tells us that that's not the right place for us to be. And you always need to take action about that fear and that intuition or whatever tells you that you're not safe and you need to find a route to feel safe. This is probably the most important. So when you feel, when you meet somebody and you feel as if something is really wrong, there is something probably wrong and it's really tempting to avoid the red flags but you know how it ends when we avoid those red flags and about this i remember a colleague of mine who told me that there is a theory that biologically explains intuition and i know that she mentioned that women developed intuition in order to avoid rape or any kind of sexual harassment there are psychologists who see it as a mechanism developed in order to keep women safe. And I would say that it's really smart to take notes and pay attention to 
our intuition. A lot of people, like Andrew and other predators, use women who don't listen to their intuition and avoid their boundaries because they know that that makes them an easy target. A lot of predators go after especially spiritual women. So please, please start listening to your own emotional intelligence. We need to heal our sexual trauma. We need to start looking at reality and if we truly want to create safe relationships and connections and therefore stop unconsciously hurting people who will later become like Andrew Tate and so many more who are like him, we need to take a brave step and find the parts of ourselves which are unsafe and help them heal. We need to admit to ourselves about what we want and get that power through objective reality in order to change it. Reality is the only way we can make a change. Change doesn't just happen magically from the outside. It always happens with change in the inside and taking action. And once you start looking at reality, no matter how ugly it is, the power you get later on from that is something unstoppable. Did you like the visit in the Wundakama? If you did, please like, subscribe, and share this content if you see it as helpful. Did you also notice the artworks in this video? They're not put accidentally. If you want to understand my philosophical reasons of why I put them in the video, you can become a crow on Patreon. In that tier, I'm posting the paintings and the contacts they have in the video. You can also see them like easter eggs but only crows can see through the messages because they are messengers themselves i would like you to support me on patreon because i need financial aid for conducting research and research projects with various institutions as well i also have playlists on spotify under my name katarina lunas if you need something to trigger and enhance your emotional experience I also created a Facebook page where we can all gather together and share everything that comes to heart. Can you hear the footsteps? They're the footsteps of illusion. It's coming. But what are you going to do about it? Accept it or do something about it?